Hello, everyone, and welcome to our very first video. I am Hi. Jane, and I'm here with my good friend, Andrew. Likewise. Hello, everyone. It's great, great privilege to be here. And thank you so much, Jane. The Andrew and Jane show, we're finally... Oh, no, the Jane and Andrew show. We should get the priorities oh, well, in We haven't quite order. discussed that one yet. Yeah, I, I slipped into alphabetical, my apologies. But yeah, um, we, we have decided um, quite accidentally on the basis of a discussion, we had a really good discussion just before Christmas that it would be really fun as we both love our history to to just get together and just have some really nice chats about movies we've seen with historical subjects, uh, what we think. Um, uh, none of this is scripted, of course. We have no idea where we're going with this, but that is the best part of this kind of thing. So even, even when we script things, we have no idea. No, no, it goes everywhere, doesn't it? So so Jane and I, oh, actually, Jane, you should tell the story. We we drew up secret lists, didn't we, of, of the top five oh, films we wanted. We did. we did, we did. Well, we kind of, uh, well, we wanted to just discuss the two things we love the most, which I think is history and storytelling. We, we are crazy for a good story, books, films, movies, whatever. And we we thought, well, we talk about this all the time anyway, so why not record it and maybe let others join in as well with their knowledge and their expertise and skills and what have you. So we actually started to make lists of historical movies that we love, and there were so many overlaps. So we thought, let's just uh, pick one and get started. And uh, here we are, here we are. And uh, Andrew, should we reveal which one we're doing today? I think we probably should. Thank you, Jane. This is the opportunity for me to show you the one and only prop I have brought to this recording. So it is, of course, the 1999 classic Gladiator, which we both loved. Uh, Jane, quick question. I'll, I'll share the answer from my perspective in a second, but be honest now. How many times did you go to the cinema to watch Gladiator? Oh, only one back in the day in the cinema. I'm oh, this is this is embarrassing. Only one, but I've watched it many times since. I I salute your discipline and and your restraint. Marcus Aurelius would have been proud of you because I I went three times. I, know, you know. I wasn't planning to go the third time, but when people said, "Oh, should we go see this Gladiator film?" I I put on my pretense face. Oh yeah, yeah, let, that's definitely. I've heard good. a lot about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's go see it. Oh, uh, well done, a true fan, a true fan. Well done. I have a feeling, Andrew, you probably know more about the movie than I do because you have the extended version, don't you? I do have the extended version. So so yes, um, for, for those few of you hiding in far corners of the earth who have never watched Gladiator, I, I would recommend you watch it. But in summary, it's the story about a man who goes from a position of power and authority to nothing and then has to fight his way back up and also avenge his family uh, and put right a great wrong. Um, I'll leave it at that because everything else is spoilers. Um, but yeah, it, it's I, I don't know too much about it, but I have, as Jane says, got the extended version. And it does mainly add a little, a little bit more about the complicated character of the 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 villain in the piece, Emperor Commodus. Um, uh, Jane, what kind of sense do you have of Commodus where, when we see him in the film? What kind of a guy is he? Well, I think if we watch this in a kind of historical context so if we just set the scene so we join the film in uh, uh 180 AD and this is also the year where Marcus Aurelius dies and uh Rome at this point is let's say vast that's not uh, that doesn't even do it justice it's a huge area it's covering the entire Mediterranean northern bits of Africa all the way up to the Germanic areas and of course, when you are trying to control such a vast kingdom empire, there is going to be uprisings and battles and, and uh, you know, whatever occurs. Um, and especially the region around the Danube River seemed to have been an area with uh, quite a bit of battles going on. And this is also where I think we have the first scene in the film. And uh, there were battles going on there for years and years and years. And uh, Marcus Aurelius, who was not just a great 
emperor, also quite a bit of a politician and quite a bit of a philosopher. I think most people know know him know him as that. And he was also one one of the five great emperors uh, known in, in Roman history. Um, but he seemed to have spent quite a bit of time there. Now, Commodus, as you say, Andrew, was a peculiar character because he spent a, a rather sheltered life in Rome um, where he kind of uh, just enjoyed life and wine and food and women uh, in excess and uh, wasn't really interested in anything relating to leadership or politics or ruling an empire. And I think one thing the film also touches on very early on, which is interesting, is that it wasn't common for a son to follow his father. So an emperor would normally pick his own successor. Uh, like we see a little bit Marcus Aurelius is doing uh, with the fictional character of Maximus, uh, the, the commander or the, the, the Roman um, uh, army leader. Um, and it seemed from historical sources, and I think the two we are especially looking at is Cassius Dio and, or Dio Cassio, sometimes you'll know him, know him, know him as that if you look him up, and, um, uh, and Tacitus, who was a Roman historian from a little bit earlier, um, of course, personal accounts and therefore not always reliable, but Commodus wasn't in any way suitable for leadership or indeed taking over as emperor. And the real life Marcus Aurelius seemed to have been adamant that his son should follow him. And that's an interesting uh, little side note, especially because he didn't seem to be fit. So why a great leader, leader like Marcus Aurelius would pick a son that didn't seem quite ready for that role uh, is, is peculiar. But that is what the young Commodus at the age of probably around 18 when he takes over, that's what he's facing. He's facing a vast empire, uh, quite a lot of uprising and and uh, and battles to deal with, um, a senate uh, of politicians that he doesn't really know how to navigate, uh, people, advisors he cannot trust, uh, and of course, even members of your own family who might be out for power. So that's what he's um, that's what he's looking at when we meet him. It's a heady mix for a teenager to blunder into, is, isn't it? And um, and it's interesting because I, I find that the senatorial element is is brought out very well in the film. And I I realize it's perhaps slightly ahistorical that that on the imminent accession of a new Caesar, a senator would trot up and openly say at a party, "Oh well, where do you stand, general? Do you think we should get rid of this guy and have a republic?" I, I think your career would be short. But but I like the way the film does that because it very it quickly establishes for the audience that there is this political tension. Uh, and and uh, I don't know how much the rest of Rome would have been particularly feeling it, but certainly at the top, there's the, there's this idea. Um, I'm glad you mentioned Tacitus because one thing that strikes me about the guy is he's always this secret Republican at heart. I, I like how every time he starts a chapter, he makes a point of saying, oh, and the consuls for this year were so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, even though it doesn't matter. But he wants to stick to the old senatorial uh, uh, formula uh, and and so yes, in a way, you kind of want to say poor Commodus because it's a lot even for a sensible person to take on. Um, and also, a good point you're making, Andrew, is that if you're ruling such a vast empire, it's impossible to do alone. You need it to delegate. You needed people, advisors to 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 take over a lot of the the just the infrastructure and the administration work. And of course, that were often people trying to take advantage of power themselves in whatever way they could. So effectively, the paranoia that often followed being emperor was not, uh, you know, entirely impossible to understand because there were uh, very often assassination attempts or uh, attempts to just get rid of you. So that was something you had to face as well, dealing with this. Mm. Yeah, so so did, I'm afraid this is at a point where my knowledge of Commodus becomes very, very minimal. I mean, did, did he rely on people or did he, uh, as the film shows, did he go it alone uh, uh, or did he that actually trust it? Good point, because if we look at Cassius Dio, and he is probably the most, huh, you should never say reliable about personal accounts, but but he he is in the, he's a senator in the Senate under Marcus Aurelius and, and Commodus. And uh, he publishes 
a vast account of volumes, 80 volumes in total, where he's basically going through the entire Roman history. He's basically give, giving us a, a thousand years of Roman history. Um, and even though we, we only have fragments today, we, we do have a lot of his knowledge, but he is going into quite a bit of detail around Commodus. And the thing is, there were other siblings, but the one we get to know the most about is his older sister, Lucilla, whom we all also meet in uh, the movie. She's about 11, 12 years older. She's married to one of her father's advisors, and she's certainly not without power, power or influence, even as a woman. She seems to have understood the political game a lot better than her younger brother. Uh, and she is also, a bit of a historical spoiler alert, um, plotting against him, perhaps to take over herself, we don't know. But uh, Commodus in real life has her exiled and later killed. So she doesn't, like in the movie, outlive him. Um, but those were, were, you know, attempts that, that seem to have been taken place quite often. Commodus seemed to be become more and more paranoid uh, as, as he ages. He only lives to around the age of 30, 32 or something, early 30s. Um, and he is also suffering from uh, quite a serious bout of uh, megalomania, megalomania, sorry. Um, and he is... Uh, um, at one point, he is, uh, this is a, a kind of interesting little historical fact, actually. Rome was facing quite a few challenges during his reign. Uh, among others, we know of a great grain shortage. So people were starving, which gave uh, room for the plague to return, thousands of people dying. Uh, we have a great fire at one point, destroying great parts of Rome. And so people are a bit down and Commodus want to lift the spirit. So he's announcing a series of games uh, gladiator games to lift the people's spirits and also to uh, gain some favor and, and uh, goodwill with his people. But slightly catch, slight catch, he's not going to watch the game as an emperor. He's going to participate. Oh, he right. So he actually went into the arena. Oh, OK. I, I remember raising an eyebrow when I saw him do that right at the end yes. of the film. And, uh, That's nice. actually not entirely untrue. Okay. Uh, but, and the movie actually picks up on this brilliantly, uh, which is quite fun because he wants to be a gladiator, but gladiators were slaves. They were not really people. They were kind of glorified slaves, if you like. People admired them for dying, you know, in, 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 in combat, but they were slaves. So the Senate is not pleased at all about this. But he has a, a gladiator, one of the best. If you were if you are a gladiator in the actual Colosseum in Rome, you are one of the best, no doubt about it. Mm. Uh, he has a gladiator, believe it or not, by the name of Narcissus, train him. And Narcissus okay. is described as a, uh, a wrestler kind of type, a, an athlete. Um, he's won a lot of, of battles and is a very famous gladiator. And... He trains Commodus, but of course you don't just train for a couple of weeks and then suddenly you're a gladiator. That is a lifetime of training. Um, and Commodus seemed to realize this along the way. And another thing that gladiators know is, of course, that when you are in the arena and you're fighting to your death, that requires an immense amount of self-control and calmness because you have to be able to take that final death blow uh, with a certain amount of calmness and self-control, which is not something Commodus seem to be possessing an awful lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and But interestingly, Commodus wins his first fight. Oh, okay. And after this, he becomes uh, uh, almost self-obsessed. He has uh, golden statues built in the city, he has coins made of himself, he even renames the months of the year after himself, and he he gives Rome a new name. Oh, really? What, what did yeah. he call them? He called Rome, let me just get this right, um, Colonia Commodiana. Oh, so he was suffering from a really bad case of excess humility by this point. <laughs> ah. Exactly. Okay. Now, now to the really fun bit. I think you're going to enjoy this, Andrew. Commodus, during these uh, um, 14 games of games, he wins more and more battles. Now, there's the reason for this. 
He has the gladiators fight with dull blades and swords. So he cannot actually oh. defend. Okay. Now, uh, of course, he, he, his, you know, his fame and glory grows among his public, who watches him win again and again. But at one point, Narcissus, his trainer, actually finds out about this, about the dull blades and, and swords. And that means Commodus in that is now actually in real danger because he has a, a, a sister who's cons conspiring against him. He has mm. the Senate against him. And he now also has the gladiators against him. The, the, these are not people you want to you want to make enemies of. And um, he also has quite severe problems at home because his wife is not producing children, which is all she's there for. So mm -hmm. she has he has her exiled and later executed. And he never remarries, but seems to take on quite a few mistresses. And uh, one and among them one called Marcia or Marcia. And he's treating her worse and worse. So she's also plotting against him. And she actually at one point tried to poison him. Oh, goodness. And okay. That seems to fail uh, for some reason. Um, and we're not sure why. But Narcissus then at the end of the day is the one who kills Commodus for his betrayal in, in, uh, in the Colosseum. And both Marcia and Narcissus are later uh, 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 executed for, for their betrayal. But Rome then seemed to enter into a period of chaos and civil war. And this is kind of the beginning of the end uh, of, of the Roman Empire, all in all. But um, there is a, uh, um, he, he's actually, there's one interesting thing we get to know as well. Commodus is, uh, after it is revealed that he has, uh, you know, cheated in the arena, he, he uh, um, writes an official document called a proscription list where he names all the people he, he's fearing will plot against him. Um, okay. That if, if, you know, if they attempt anything against him, he can have them exiled and or executed. Um, and possibly this list somehow ends up with one of the senators. And that's the final blow, really, for Commodus. But there seems to have been a, a, not just an immense amount of paranoia, but also um, self-status. Uh, um, At one point, he's even describing himself as Hercules himself. So, yes, modest, I don't believe he was. <laughs> No, no. And and I see what you mean about that list, because, of course, once something like that leaks, everyone's going to be crowding over it to check whether their name's on it. And if it is instant enemy, even if you weren't thinking of moving against the emperor, it's now a matter of self-preservation, isn't it? Yeah. Um, True. Yeah. Well, I kind of wanted to link all of this to the movie, Andrew. This is where you are really good because there's so many things that I think the movie picks up on, but it's not necessarily mentioned. It's just sort of hinted at. Yeah, there are a lot of light touches. So, so the the um, the problems Rome was facing that you mentioned, the 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 shortage of grain and the plague, which which really some historians have said was was Europe's very first touch, possibly of what later became the Black Death in medieval Europe. You know, the, the Chinese empire was suffering from similar plagues at the time. It's very possible that, that via unfortunate Parthia, this stuff was making its way over. Uh, and in the film, they do reference in the Senate um, the plague which has broken out in the city, um, but they use it as a means of illustrating how disinterested Commodus is in government because the the, the serious senator, Gracchus, played by uh, Derek Jacobi, is busy trying to say, you know, the, you should be paying attention as your father did. And, and I think Commodus, if I remember right, is just spinning his sword in a very bored way and going, oh, no, this is not for me. Um, and they they do mention the economic problems, but they turn it on their head because I understand that that Commodus very cleverly wanting to keep the common people on side funded the games by levying a new senatorial tax. So no prizes for guessing why the senators didn't like him. In the movie, they they link it with the grain problem when Lucilla tells the senators that that he's selling the grain reserve. So essentially selling Rome's future. Um, which is a nice way of touching on these things, but without bogging people down in excess detail. And 
I raise an eyebrow slightly at the fact they don't mention he's taxing the senators. But in but in the grand tradition of a morality play, I suppose you do have to have someone who's very much a bad guy. And they already have a twisted senator who's on side with him in the person of, uh, I think it's Falco. And so they don't really need uh, an, another bit of senatorial self-interest that they need to flesh out. I think people get it. It's very good storytelling and it is at the expense of the history. But I do think that if you tell a good story, great that you've put those details in to reinforce Um but you know, fine as it goes, uh, and with the the intrigues as well, they they Commodus captures the paranoia very well, and and hats off to Joachim Phoenix for playing that so well. I I would just say there's definitely a lot of whitewashing of Lucilla uh, from what you tell me. I had no idea that that she actually had an active role in in you know possibly as you say we don't know trying to unseat him. Um, but but she certainly in the film, she is intriguing against him, but it's in a very good, she has good and noble reasons, yes. yeah. uh, which and I'm sure historically would be a bit well. dubious. Yeah, they use her son really well as that kind of, you know, motherly son kind of, uh, she's kind of in a bit of a trap because of her son. Yes, yes. Now, speaking of, of Lucilla, there's a very interesting thread that runs through much of the film, and it's this very disturbing relationship that Commodus wants to have with her and it's bordering upon the kind of incest that earlier Roman emperors were quite keen on but but is there anything historically to that or were they just trying to to give Commodus yet another shade of dark in his character not that I have found um so I'm not sure if that was just a little bit of a, a, a movie storytelling spin um she is, though, the one sibling that seemed to be mentioned the most in sources and that we seem to know about, maybe because of her marriage or maybe because she actually was quite clever. I mean, she, in order to, to even plot against her brother, she must have been in quite a few senators' favour. Uh, or else you, you just cannot do that kind of thing. You wouldn't even get near him. Um, so she does seem to have quite a bit of an influence, uh, especially as a woman. Uh, but what her motives might ha have been, or if it was for maybe one of her own children, a son maybe, who, who she wanted to maybe sit on the throne instead of her brother, or simply because she didn't like her brother very much, we, we're not sure. I, I couldn't find anything that kind of told us about those. But you're right, that relationship is disturbing. Yeah, it's it's very it, it's there right from the start of the film and it's there right at the end, because I think before he before he dies in the arena in the film. Whoops, sorry, guys, spoilers. Uh, it, the very last meeting he has with um, uh, with Lucilla, you, you see the mask slips uh, because he's never quite got there through the film. But then he makes it absolutely clear that she, he effectively wants her to become some kind of gross wife to him uh and and the mind boggles but anyway <laughs> um no but that that's really you interesting right as well andrew because that that this the brother sister marriage was not unusual we also see it in any ancient egypt with mm. some of the old pharaohs so it did happen um i don't think it was common because you did understand there were certain risks but there was this idea of pure blood uh, that that needed to to sort of uh, be there on the throne some somehow, but uh, so so you know noblemen and the elite of Rome marriage each other. There's no doubt about it. Um, oh, okay. Uh, you you would you could take mistresses. Yes, you could take whoever you want. Basically, they they were at your disposal, and it wasn't unusual to take what I think we would call concubines. Mm. Uh, that that was what you, you could have that as well. Um, one of your servants or whoever. Um, they were there for you to use, basically, and they were always slaves as well. Um, but uh, I'm not sure the brother-sisterly sort of relationship was something they did an awful lot, but it did happen. Right. But it had a disturbing dimension in the movie to this character. <laughs> Yes, yeah, and and he is very deep. I mean, uh, there was only one other thing I wanted to bring up about Commodus, which struck me from the film, and this is from one of the director's cut scenes where there, there's many different ways of looking at the character, and and again, Phoenix plays him brilliantly. 
Um, but one thing that that come comes through is you, you you almost think of him a bit of a coward because of the way he sets Maximus up to fail uh, um, at, at the very end of the film. But there's a moment in the middle of the film, a, a very short director's scene, where he arrests two of his Praetorians. When he discovers Maximus is still alive, he is infuriated because apparently they told him that Maximus had died in Germania. Um, and so the men responsible are to be executed by arrow fire. And um, and he uses it as an object lesson to the Praetorians about what happens when you're guilty of treason. But what I find remarkable is that he stands in between, the, the two men who are about to die are tied to posts. And if you imagine these are the two posts, Commodus stands here when he's talking to them. And without flinching, he tells Quintus the general to give the archers the order to fire knowing full well that, you know, if if anyone had treasonous thoughts, it would only be a matter of twitching to kill the emperor. And uh, and so it's a test of their loyalty, but it's a really, you know, I'm cashing all my chips in on this one. And it really, it really puts a whole different spin on the guy. It makes him an even more complicated character than he is already. And, and I don't actually know what to make of it, but I think it's partly one of the reasons one comes back and watches this film so much, because the villain is actually quite interesting. He really is. He really, and in real life as well. He re Oh, I wish they kept that scene in. Yeah, they, they should have done, but I'm glad it was in the extended. Um, but I suppose, the, the, of course, we've, we've, there's so much to say about Commodus, but we, we have his counterbalance. We, ha we have the kind of guy that every uh, Roman morality play type historian would love. You, you have the stolid, loyal, unflappable, brave Maximus. I mean, we're, when he comes sauntering you know, onto the stage of this film, I mean, do... Do we have a historical Maximus? Was there ever a general of this name? Or The name, yes, was probably quite usual. I, I think Maximus in the film is probably a mix of various commanders and generals, maybe. Okay. Uh, there, he isn't a historical figure. Um, uh, and there was no, uh, you, you know, fighting... Uh, um, uh, Commodus in the arena. Uh, th there was fighting Commodus as a gladiator during his games. And there may have been a Maximus among the gladiators as well that we don't know about, uh, but no one who defeated Commodus. Uh, he was killed later by by um, by Narcissus, the, his, his trainer gladiator. But um, it's more likely that he is a hero, a mix of maybe a few different historical sources and that of um a script direct a script a script writer's imagination but he is a really really good character and i think another thing we also talked about andrew is um he's he's of course called the spaniard hmm. in the film and is from i'm not sure if we get to know where in the spanish area but hmm. i like that they are distinguishing even though everything is within the roman empire that there were sort of things that the various areas um, within the empire were good at or had as specialties. Like for example, uh, um, uh, uh, breeding horses, like we know they're really good at in Spain, for example. And I like that they picked up on those little details that there were differences and they actually pick up on the, of those. There's also one, a gladiator called uh, something, the Gaul. Oh, yes. A uh, uh, name begins with a T. Uh, but yes, he's the retired champion, the, the yes. big guy, am yes. among the whole host of yes. big guys. <laughs> so clearly you know, had that sort of reference point. You are from there. You're from there uh, kind of thing going on. And I like the horses he's carrying on his chest as well throughout most of them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they, they it, it's it's a beautiful nod to his, his homeland and and it's a very uh, a progressive idea that that I suppose in that day what at that day what was really important was whether you were a citizen of Rome uh, rather than what your your or your ethnicity or your former nationality was there was it's all about the citizenship and I'm I'm re I'm uh, because that really gives you membership of this um it's really interesting and quite cosmopolitan family. Um, and it's a major thing because, yes, he's he's a he's obviously a very a, from a fairly wealthy family because the, the glimpses yeah. we have of his estate in Spain, I mean, they're fairly extensive. Yeah. 
I don't I don't know whether he inherited that. He probably did. Um, but but the fact that someone like that from admittedly a wealthy of distant province is rubbing shoulders with the imperial family is I, I understand something that could happen fairly easily because it's all about that connection. Uh, yes, that you I think have. Right. There, there, there was a possibility of uh, of raising yourself to a higher status, and also, we, and we get to see this in the film as well that a gladiator could be freed. Um, and we even get, I've forgotten his name now, but but Maximus's uh, owner. Um, uh, Pro Proximo. Proximo. Proximo, yes. He actually, he was a former gladiator and he actually has a wooden sword that he has been presented with uh, when he became a free man. And this was a thing as well, we, we, we have descriptions of that uh, an emperor could free a slave, uh, for example, if he had done well in the arena, by presenting him with a wooden sword. So that's a nice little touch as well. Oh, wonderful. Okay, yes, because, uh, yes, Proximo is another character in the film who, who, given that he's not in it that much, displays quite surprising uh, depth. Uh, and, of course, Oliver Reed, uh, God rest him, was one of those actors who could just bring awesomeness into any yeah. I think he was very well cast uh, they were a bit unlucky that he passed away halfway through the yes, filming and, I read and, about uh, that but he had such a presence you know yeah. in that and he's he's really really brilliantly cast in that role um but I think overall the film was brilliantly cast I think there are mm. some amazing uh I mean, even though he's in it very, very little, but Richard Harris is just always good, isn't he? Oh yes, yes, um, yeah. I, I can't. And uh, and yes, uh, Connie Nielsen as Lucilla was brilliant. She played the role really well. Not a relation, I'm assuming. I but... was about to say, I don't know. We <laughs> from the same part of Denmark, so she might be. Oh, She's... oh my gosh! Okay. Not <laughs> been to any of the family dinners though. I'm a little disappointed. No, no, you should have auditioned. It might have been um, you in there. Oh, that would have been fun. That would have been fun. <laughs> I think you'd have done really well. Uh, <laughs> oh, bless you, Andrew. You're too kind. But no, she's not, she's not actually, but she I think she was really well cast as well because she is she has that sort of elder sisterly, uh, sort of a little bit uh, um not condescending, but she's sort of uh, lifting up her little brother and at the same time she gets more and more desperate throughout the movie as as he clearly gets more and more well crazy uh mm. but but um but i think she's actually doing really well and there is i like the fact that there isn't just a because i think this may maybe this would have been too obvious to just create a romance between her and maximus and we kind of get the hint that maybe they saw each other a little bit when they were younger and before they both were married, but there isn't really anything going on there now. Um, mm. and, I, and I think maybe that would have been a little too obvious in the movie, but but I like that we only get that little hint. <laughs> yes, it, it is beautifully balanced. And I, I love how it, because of course, tragically, Maximus never loses his devotion to his wife yeah. and son, even after they, they're killed. And you never really get to know them because they just appear and they have no dialogue. And um, um, but it's it's such a touching part of his character that it's all about them. Um, yeah. And and I think I think it's great that it's not just purely a story about vengeance and restitution. I think in a way there's this fatalistic side to Maximus where it's not that he stops caring about life, but but he would em he would embrace death if it comes because of this whole concept of Elysium and they'll all be reunited. And and that's really what seems to be pushing him through a lot of the film. And I think I think if he had got into a relationship with Lucilla, it would have unbalanced that. True. Whereas yeah. They, as you say, they they have this gorgeous hint that there was something there once, possibly before he had his family. In fact, very likely before he did, and uh, and there's just enough of it to give them both that bit of extra strength to carry on. Um, and they have that very touching final meeting before it all goes terribly wrong for the the conspiracy in the short term. That's true. And also that, I mean, an, another thing that we probably forget a little bit nowadays is that a, a gladiator was there to die. They were sent in there to die. So death was incredibly present. I mean, uh, uh, death was everywhere, especially in a major city like Rome. You you died all the time from starvation, from the plague, from, uh, you know, various diseases, from being killed, 
Um, mm. You know, death was a, a, a children, you know, barely reached the most children would barely reach the age of age of five. You know, um, there were there were just a different sort of presence around death that you just had to, I was about to say live with, but but it was just kind of a thing in society that was always there. Uh, and of course, uh, even more so for a gladiator. Uh, mm. and, and maybe that, you know, when you're living in a society like that, maybe that whole idea of a heaven or an Elysium or something grows even bigger because there has to be something then that you that you hold on to. But actually, I, I do like those little sort of glimpses we get f from Maximus's point of view in the film that he's now sort of he's going to them. He's going to his wife and his son. And it's very yeah. poignant and very sort of beautifully done. Yeah, yeah. And and you're right. It's such it's such a harsh time. It's very hard for us to visualize, I imagine, because we're large. I mean, uh, OK, we have our own problems in, in the here and now, but I think if we if we sat down in a calf and tried to unburden ourselves on a Roman from 180 AD, they would probably wonder what on earth we were complaining about. <laughs> um, and and I suppose that's the other thing that a, a lot of a lot of people I know, while they they have so much respect for Roman society and they see a lot of parallels uh, between Roman society and ours. The one thing very few of us can understand is this Roman obsession with blood sport and and uh, yeah. and the casual shedding of blood really in the name of entertainment. I think Proximo even has a couple of lines in the film where he says to Maximus, oh, you're a general, you fight for honour. Me, I'm an entertainer. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, um... He was not wrong, you know, because mm. gladiators knew that if you could win the crowd you probably won the fight you didn't have to be the strongest because if people were cheering for you and your name that was enough uh so they were kind of and we also get this impression or at least i got a little bit when i read about narcissus that he was a bit of a showman he did know how to win the crowd he was a good fighter i mean by all means you had to be mm. but but he was a bit of a showman and and he seems to have tried to convince Commodus that this was it's not necessarily going to be enough that you are emperor you're going to, going to have to prove yourself and you're going to have to prove to the crowd that you can do this and therefore his betrayal with the the dulled blades and swords even becomes even bigger because you know this is not a place where you um, in any way fight unfairly. This is a place mm. where you, I was about to say, die as a gentleman, if there is such a thing. But but this is this is where you, you know, you pick that that one up. And you're also right, Andrew, when you say this was brutal. Mm. I mean, this was a scene, this was a spectacle of horse races, of wild animals fighting wild animals, fighting humans, humans fighting each other. This was this was a massive, brutal spectacle. And I don't think we can even today, if we sat and saw this, we probably couldn't even comprehend what we were watching. But this was blood being shed literally in front of thousands of people cheering. Yeah, we, we I just find it so weird because I, I, I'm one of those slightly wimpy people who who struggle with the idea that that people cheer at boxing matches where, you know, guys with padded gloves are just thumping each other in a, in a way that gladiators would have probably found quite tame uh and and yeah so it, it does it does uh make me wonder but but then as you said the the prevalence of death and the fragility of life in that period probably meant that that people were really comfortable with the idea that death was a thing um and um and also, I, I guess there is, uh, I, I'm not a psychologist, so I won't tread into uh, areas I don't know much about, but uh, I have heard it said that there's a bit of an adrenaline rush that people get uh, in blood sports that you you don't get with other forms of sport. And it's a truly horrific thing, but it, it probably presses our, our um, prehistoric buttons a little bit. The, the, those same buttons that we've gradually, you know, trained ourselves out of as a society. Yeah. Um, but evidently it was still very strongly there in Rome. And uh, that's a really good point. Yes. Yeah. And, and there's a bit of light shed on it when when the young Lucius Varus, Lucilla's son, who doesn't really have that many lines in the film, but uh, he's talking to Maximus uh, and, and Maximus says, your uncle lets you watch the games. And he says, oh, yes, he says it will make me strong. And you think, oh, right. OK, it's that 
that kind of idea that we shove very much in, under the heading of toxic masculinity these yeah. days. But I suppose back in the day, oh, toughen you up, boys. Watch a few men get get you know done un, done in with pointy metal objects, and they'll make a man out of you. <laughs> that's true. that's a really really good point. It does say a lot about psychology as well, doesn't it? And 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 I guess also that entire belief that your status I mean fame is always fleeting it comes and it goes and it only takes a famine you know to to go from popular to very un unpopular mm. but um but that belief that you could actually turn into something else in the arena um and and we also see this actually I think this is in the movie as well in a few clips where these these um sort of outfits of like a lion's head or skin on the head or a bear or something uh mm -hmm. this, this sort of display of strength by taking on almost the persona of a wild animal or of a sometimes a god like hercules or something that you you somehow um possess their skills or strength in the arena through this display um and I guess maybe we're doing the same a little bit today, you know, when we're watching, like you said, boxing fights and wrestling matches or whatever that, you know, there, there is a there's a huge amount of show off and entertainment yeah. in that we, as well. <laughs> we we do idolize them. And actually, there's a nice contemporary time. You know how terribly disappointed we are when we read in the paper that an athlete has been caught using drugs Uh <laughs> It's such a blow and you go, oh, I really liked that guy. Can't believe he did that. I've got no respect for him anymore. So I completely see where you're coming from with the whole line about Narcissus reaction when he catches Commodus with the whole blunt sword thing. It's like, do you realize what this is going to do to your reputation? It's it's the Roman equivalent of taking a couple of steroids before wandering, so wandering onto the arena. <laughs> so true. So true. That must have been that must have been the case. And and it was, I guess, also a, a, a way of completely violating that belief of gladiators. You know, those people f raw fighting to the very end. You know, mm. uh, and and he, of course, doing it. Commodus doing it for the for the sake of glory uh, uh, and and uh, in a way immortality. Um, but but yeah, so true. So true. there's some. You got some some really good perspectives on this, Andrew, about the entire psychology. I think also we see in the movie not just the relationship between uh, Lucilla and her brother, but also we we get a little bit of it in the beginning between father and son, don't we? Yes, we do, and it it is a very complicated relationship and beautifully fleshed out in a very short scene. Because of course, uh, um, uh, Commodus kills his father so early on; they don't really have that much time to talk. I am very touched by the scene um, when um, uh, Aurelius, Marcus Aurelius, tells Commodus he will not be emperor, and you really don't know whether at that point Commodus even knows he's going to kill his father, uh, whether it's crocodile tears he's shedding or whether he's genuinely genuinely upset. But th there's those brilliant lines where he says, you know, you wrote to me once listing the four cardinal virtues. And as I read them, I realized I had none of them. And you you get a lot of rage in that, but you also get this this terrible sense of a, a a man who's still a very small child inside, who's got used to the idea that he's a disappointment to his father, and it just seems to have this terrible impact on him. Not not just uh, 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 throughout the film, but there's the implication that on his life up yeah. to that point. Um, and there's another scene. I I can't remember whether this was in the original version or whether the extended dropped it in. But he goes down to the crypt when he's back in Rome after he's become emperor. And oh, I don't know. I haven't seen that. Oh, in that it must be one of the deleted scenes then. And when he comes before his father's statue, he goes into a bit of a rage, draws his sword, really hacks at it, and then bursts into tears, drops his sword and embraces the statue. And you just think that there's some really complex stuff going on down there. Um, it was actually in the original film. I can't remember. I, I, I'll have to find a copy of the un, uh, <laughs> the unextended original. Watch it. Guys, com comments. Tell us whether that was yeah. in the original <laughs> or not. <laughs> um, yeah. 
Uh, oh yeah, that's actually a brilliant way of displaying that in a movie, isn't it? With that of kind kind of a very simple little scene because because the father is not there anymore. So are you angry that you killed him? Are you angry that he's not here <laughs> for you to yeah. shout at anymore? You know, are you angry that you cannot figure out how to do his job? Um, yeah, yeah. Are are you feeling remorseful or are you just kind of cross because? you maybe i don't know it, it's 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 beautifully done and wonderfully ambiguous um, yes. but but there's definitely the 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 sense that you know there is something very wrong there and perhaps at some level commodus as presented in the film knows that there's something very wrong with him but doesn't really know what to do about it so yeah, uh, yeah. also he must have felt because even the real life commodus I mean, this this uh, bout of complete superhuman madness must have come from an immense insecurity as well and from knowing that he probably wasn't up for the job because it didn't seem like anyone really thought he was, and especially not the senators. So they would have started out having, well, not a huge amount of respect for him when he first took to the throne, this 18-year-old mm. boy, you know. Yeah, no, it, it, it's... Uh, it... It, it is an incredibly difficult one. It kind of brings us back full circle to where we were, where the poor guy first walks into his throne and thinks, oh, my word, what the <laughs> Probably thought, oh, my word, what the heck is going on yeah. here? Yeah. Yeah. But he seemed to have been chosen his advisors quite badly, and maybe that also upset the Senate quite a bit. And, and uh yeah, I, th I think there were, there were probably a series of not particularly well thought of choices there. Um but but in a way, although of course there are differences in the movie, and and also real life Commodus didn't kill his father, but I think in a way the beauty touches beautifully upon upon those little psychological nuances and the complexity of that character sitting on the throne, being emperor of what could basically be described as as the better part of the world, you know, and so yeah. you know, one man sitting in that post, you know. Of course, you would have had enemies all around you all the time. <laughs> yes, and I, I can see why he hunkers down, uh, uh, both historically and in the film, because it, it's a very natural human reaction, I think, when you're feeling overwhelmed to just not want anything to do with it. Uh, uh, oh, God, I can't cope. So I'm just going to uh, you. You seem to know what you're doing. You can be my friend and advisor and you can make policy for me. I, I just uh, I'll, I'll go organize some games. Yay, distraction. <laughs> I want brain shortage. Why would I want to deal with that? Go sort it out, you know. <laughs> yeah, just just deal with the complexity, man. I, I can't cope with this. <laughs> oh, true, true. Uh, Andrew, what else do we need to touch on? Well, the, um, I managed to find a very old um, interview with Ridley Scott, which was conducted right after the film was released. And I think about the time it was being nominated for one of its ultimately many awards, uh, well-deserved awards, I should say. And, and he, he made some interesting observations, both about the fact that, that the film is is meant to be, among its many other things, uh, a lesson and a warning in a way that that uh, someone like Tacitus or, or another, you know, history, the purpose of history is to impart a moral lesson school of thought. And and the warning, uh, I think he 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 wanted was was to to people to pay more attention to their surroundings because the the big unspoken lesson in Gladiator, although the senators moan about this, is that the power of the the ultimate power in rome ultimately rests with they dismissively call them the mob but it's really yeah. the people um but the point is also made about how easily people are distracted when the world is literally burning around them and 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 scott actually said in this interview that if you draw parallels between roman society and our society never mind the type of entertainment we both live in in societies where to a degree citizens have responsibilities, but we also love our entertainment. And when the going gets tough, we turn to our entertainment because it helps us block out the world out there. Uh, and I think it's uh, it's Gracchus, the senator, who has the line where he says, oh, yes, he'll um, he'll take away their freedom and they will love him for it because he's so busy giving them games and entertainment at the same time. Um, 
And I can't quite, re- it was a long time ago, I can't quite remember what was going on in the context of the late 1990s, but but there's clearly some element of reminding audiences on a more serious note that actually, you know, that there, there's a, that there, there's a point at which you become so distracted, you you forget to you forget to look up at real life, and you forget to deal with your problems, and you may be. Although luckily in Gladiator, the people of Rome have this amazing hero who steps forward and saves the day for them. Those people may not always be around to to make the change for you, um, and that was a very interesting subtlety that I'd never picked up on at the time. But hearing him say that, I, I look I look at Gladiator in a new way now when I when I go back to the film. That that is a brilliant point. That is such a brilliant point, and it's it's very subtle as well. That he 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 because it, when you mention it now, it does come through. You know. Yeah, that you know, we we are easily distracted, and I think we have. We look at our own politicians today. We probably are. I mean, if you if you as a politician, if you have some bad news that you know will become public at some point, make sure you hide it in some bigger news, and people will forget about it. You know, and that's kind of the attitude. So so it oh, that is so subtle. I love that point. Yeah, it it's um it it puts a whole new dimension on what I mean. What is already a very well thought out yeah. film. I've got to um, I've, I've certainly got to hand it to Ridley and the others for Gladiator because it 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 is one of the epic films of its time. And and I suppose the only other thing I, I could think of to say was it really it rehabilitated the sword and sandal epic. <laughs> After a very long time when those films okay. had been out in the wilderness. Yeah, because, I mean, you had amazing greats like Ben-Hur and the fall yeah. of the Roman Empire and Quo Vadis. And, and they were amazing and they had their day. But I think if anyone had tried to make them in the 90s, but following the formula of the 50s and 60s, yeah, um, it, would it, it would have fallen completely flat. And I think Gladiator really took the epic uh, of, of that genre and gave it a new lease of life. Because actually there hadn't really been a proper, I was about to say toga film, uh, for a very, very long time. There hadn't been a Roman sort of, uh, uh, no, we hadn't even had a proper like Cleopatra kind of film for a very long time in, in the late no. 90s. No, this was actually kind of new. Um, but a brilliant way of also bringing history to life, because I'm pretty sure a lot of people started to look into, OK, who was this Commodus again? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it was fascinating for me because I did some classics modules at uni, but really the, the Roman world, aside from the very basics, was very much a closed one to me. And yeah. uh, and it did get me interested in in a way that I I sort of I mean Rome was there. You spend your summers visiting some Roman ruins, that kind of thing. But uh, but it really it really breathed some life into it for me. Yes. I don't know. What, do you and, remember your impressions when you walked out after seeing the film for the first time? I remember being incredibly imp- This was just before I started studying studying archaeology. So I was interested in archaeology, but I didn't know an awful lot at the time. But I do remember being incredibly impressed by the entire cinematography and the costumes and everything. I do remember that for some reason. And I think it was because I had been to the Colosseum, so I had seen that. But the glimpse we get in the movie is just stunning. And it really gives you that idea of, oh, my God, to have been there, standing there, seeing that place as it was when it was, you know, at its very peak of everything. I mean, it's impressive enough right now, if you go to it now and you stand there. It, but but back then, it must have been just an unbelievable sight, even from the outside looking at that place. Um, it was a stunning, stunning, is still a stunning piece of architecture that I'm, I'm really happy we've managed to preserve. But, but also just imagine what it must have been like seeing it with thousands and thousands of people and uh, 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 performers and gladiators and wild animals and horse races and what have you. I, it must have blown your mind 
Yeah, yeah. And it, it's, uh, I, I think, I don't know who's saying it. There, there is a saying, all, all roads lead to Rome, but all, all, all roads in Rome lead to the Colosseum. It really is the beating uh, yes. uh, centre, uh, heart of the capital. And uh, yes. um yeah, no, the the place where everything really happens. It it's funny. We we talk about we talk jokingly about proper business being conducted in the pub after work. I do wonder how how you know many major decisions and 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 anything from business transactions to everything got got combined with the entertainment at the venue because mm. that's where you see people. And I think it was also where you came to be seen. You know, yeah. to form connections and networks and all of that. That's true. That was a huge social element uh, into that as well. I was wondering, Andy, and when you first the first the first time you you went to see it, <laughs> the, the number one time you went to see it, what was your feeling coming out? I I was basically overwhelmed in a good way. I, I mean, even with my limited knowledge of the period, I, I recognised that they they'd taken history and they had they had interpreted it rather loosely I think is the polite way of putting it but in doing so they had told such an amazing story mm. and such a beautifully presented story that in in a way I didn't care and there's not there's not been that many I mean normally you know me I get quite uptight when historical epics do terrible things oh, yeah. I walked out of Gladiator going yeah, I saw what you did there. That was actually really, really good. And I think it speaks volumes that I can I could go back to Gladiator and watch it again as I did a few days ago. And it it has lost none of its magic. It it, you know, I was captivated the whole time. Um, I don't know if if uh, if you know people might have offered me cups of tea. Or I, I didn't hear, I didn't care, I was just <laughs> I was that's the mark of a good movie. If you can go back and rewatch it and still feel that same, uh, you know, awe, that that is when you are facing good storytelling, and that's basically what it is. Yes, yeah, they, they, yeah, as you rightly say, it's it's the height of good storytelling, and and I suppose the the question I would ask people generally is that, I mean, we all have heard of Gladiator. And thanks to Gladiator, there have been a fair number of sword and sandal movements, uh, sorry, movies in the decades since. How many titles can we remember other than Gladiator when it comes to sword and sandal that have been made since the year 2000? Because I cannot name, well, maybe 300 at a pinch, but I cannot name one. I watched, wasn't there a new version of Ben-Hur? Yes, there was. I haven't seen it. I have. And I, it's very embarrassing because I should remember it better. I cannot remember when that came out, but I re do remember it being very good. Uh, I was a little nervous that I was sort of comparing with the the, the original one, the old one. Um, but it was actually quite well put together. I cannot remember now who was in it, which is embarrassing, but I do remember enjoying it. Please comment. Uh, if you remember where, where, uh, when that film came out and who was in it, but uh, I do remember liking it. So there was a Ben Hur thing coming out, um, or a remake of Ben Hur. It, I think it followed the same plot and the same um, storyline as the original one. Um, from when was that? This fifth was it back from the fifties? Oh God! Well, Charlton Heston looks disturbingly young in the yes. in in, yes. in uh, original Ben Hur, as do quite a number of his fellow uh, actors. <laughs> people will know. People will know. Oh yeah, no, that's true. That's true. There hasn't been a lot. There hasn't been a lot. I can no, but. But it's a it's a mark of its success, though. And I tell you what, I will go away and watch Ben Hur in a bit because uh, when, when I next get a moment. Because thank you for the recommendation. And should we mention, Andrew, that maybe, maybe, maybe there is a Gladiator two coming? Yes, out. yes. Uh, Ridley Scott has announced that Gladiator two is in the works. I don't know too much about it, but I understand it picks up the story roughly a generation later, and that it may feature the. Uh, a grown-up version of the young Lucius Varus in some capacity or other. Interesting. Or oh, we'll be back for that one then. 
Oh yes, yes. I mean, I will go and see it. It's like you know, having 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 seen what was achieved with this, yeah. I I got to at least go back and see it when when Gladiator Two comes out. So so we'll look forward to that. But but Jane, was there anything you wanted to to yeah, say? I think we we'll probably think of like a zillion things after this recording, and then we're going to have to make a, a second video about Gladiator because we can go <laughs> on and on. But yeah, please let us know in the comments and and like the video and and subscribe and all of that. You know what to do. And 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 please let us know. You know if there are any movies that you would like us to discuss because we do love movies and we have a great list already that we kind of want to dive into. Uh, and let us know if you've enjoyed this. We certainly have. It's been awesome, Jane. Thank you. And yeah, guys, thank you for sitting with us uh, for all this time. As Jane says, please do comment. We'd love your feedback, too. It's been a great conversation, but we would enjoy your input as well. And um, yeah, well, Jane, thank you so much. This has been absolutely brilliant. And we're off to an amazing start, I think. So already looking forward to the next one. And um, always I, a pleasure, Andrew. I will see you again soon. Missing you Absolutely. already. <laughs> Absolutely. And likewise, and take care.